Seth, welcome back to the show, mate. Yeah, brother, it's good to be here. Awesome. Well, I think um, a lot has happened, um, like I was saying just, just before the show, I think a lot has happened in your life um, very quickly. It wasn't too long ago that you were on here for round one. But, mate, just first off, how's the transition been from um, moving all your stuff over to Texas? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Man, look, we're in Austin, so I'm in Austin, Texas. Uh, it's it's a culturally pretty different California. So, I mean, I've been mm-hmm. living in the US basically two years now. Um, you know, it's oh, it's it's so different here, man. I don't even know where to start. I mean, you know, and I'll speak to this openly because it's so interesting. So, in Australia, we don't have a gun culture. We just, this is non-existent. Like we don't, you know, if you want to get a gun to go shooting or hunting, it's a six or 12 month process. Like, you've, you know, you can only get a specific type of gun, which is a hunting rifle. You've got to go through all these process, man, here, you can just walk into a sports store without uh-huh. sell guns. You hand your ID over and you just literally, you wait a few minutes to an hour. They approve you and you get, you just get a gun. Like it's just the culture here wow. is different similar in California, but here they're just far more liberal with all this. And so Mm. that affects um, the way people hold their own internal values and the collective values here in Texas. So for example, freedom as a value, freedom of speech, freedom of communication, freedom to do what one wants as a civil person is very, very high on the priority list. And that affects the way people interact, that affects government, that affects um, corporate here. It's just, and I'm still trying to understand all that because this is different. It's not that I don't, look, I understand it, but functioning in it, it's a, it's a different thing. It's, it's just interesting, you know? Yeah, yeah, it is. And look, I mean, like, it's such a, it's so different for us here. You know, I think, I mean, I was, I was only young when um, John Howard got rid of all the guns here. So I've, I've never really known. It's very bizarre for me to even see a gun. You know, I'm like, oh, shit, what the hell is yeah. that? That looks like a weird coffee, <laughs> you know. Yeah. But, um, it's just very strange. <laughs> so I think, and, and like, I think freedom is a brilliant value, but, you know, how far does that kind of water flood into we should be able to hold our guns and things? And do you, is it just a matter of, I don't know, you're walking around, you see them everywhere? No, it's not so much. I mean, in saying that, though, open carry is legal here. So in other words, mm. if... It's it's not, and I haven't seen this yet myself. But it's not uncommon for it's in, it's first of all it's legal. So it's legal for someone to have a semi-automatic rifle on their back, walking around. That's legal to do that. It's not an issue at all. Gosh. So they, they, if they, as long as and again you can have concealed carry here, but you need a license for that. But you don't need a license for open carry. So my understanding, I could be wrong, but my understanding mm. is I'm pretty sure this is accurate. You can walk around with a shotgun. You can't walk around with a fully automatic weapon, weapon which is when you pull the trigger and it's just <laughs> semi-automatic means you've got to keep pulling the trigger. Right? This is a difference. Oh. Way better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, there's a few differences, but I mean, you can walk around with a semi-automatic weapon, like a pretty sure you can walk around with a like a machine gun, like an AR-15 or a um, M16. I think M16 is semi-automatic. I'm not sure. I'm not a gun expert, um, but you know, it's just a different different culture. You can't. I don't think you can do that in California, though. You can't walk around open carry in California. Concealed mm. carry, yes. You have to go through licenses. It's just a different world here, man, and particularly with everything going on. I mean, I was in the in the gun shop the other day because I'm getting um I'm le- going to learn how to I'm getting myself a recurve bow. I'm going to oh, learn yeah. how to shoot bow and arrows and just yes. I really want to act like target shooting and just practice getting that skill up. And I'm just excited to learn something new. And that's where they sell guns and everything else there. And I was yes. just chatting to guys just because I, I want to learn. And I'm just curious what's happening. And they they have sold out of so many guns, so much ammunition, because people are a little scared. They're fearful. So when they have access to weapons, they just go and buy and hoard weapons like they hoard toilet paper and water and shit like that. Oh <laughs> my fucking crazy, man. There's no, you, you, I mean, you can get ammo, don't get me wrong, but it's really challenging to get popular ammo like 9 millimeter ammo. Um, yeah. It's just interesting, man. Yeah, yeah, super. It's unbelievable. I think, um, you know, my partner was in um, um, Austin for a bit. She'd just done her breathwork course in Albuquerque. And she went through and, yeah, and was coming back. And she was saying it's just that, 
Yeah, it's just a bit different. I've I've always been I've always been fascinated by it. I, th- I think you know, like yourself, there are two ways we can look at the whole political world. You know, and this is obviously not a show about politics, but just as a yeah. as a slight segue, I suppose you can look at someone and go, they're all wrong. I have it right, and my ego reigns superior over the world, <laughs> over the free world. Um, or you know, maybe there's something to that. And um, for whatever reason probably because of my own ignorance, the gun thing has been really hard for me to understand. So I think I'd actually need to spend some time over there, a bit like yourself and go, okay, this is, this is what it is. But um, yeah, wow, that's fascinating. Surely you'd be loving the weather though in Austin. No, 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 oh. no fucking way, Tom. Fuck you. It's too no. humid. It's too, it's too oh, hot. Right. <laughs> right, California's right. deluxe. California's yes. fucking awesome. Yeah. Um, this is like nor- Northern Queensland, you know. It's, too, oh. it's it, summer here, man, is we didn't come here for the weather. We came here for other reasons. My, my wife's family's here. We came here because value for money here, man, is amazing compared to California. Um, in terms of our, our home that we got, um, but also because we felt it's really good for our service and our expression, mm-hmm. our business, and, and that's been amazing so far. And there's an amazing community here, and, and Austin is a cool place. It's super green, super hilly, lots of lakes, water sports, really outdoors, but summer is super hot. So summer is very humid, you know, 40, 42 degrees, 43 degrees, you know, like a 100, 100, 500, 10 Fahrenheit. It, not often 110, but hot, man, and humid, very humid. Like you walk outside and you were sweating like you're in Singapore or Southeast Asia. It's just super, super hot. But that's just something. Jeez. Yes, yes, yeah. God, every, I thought that was winter. Every other time's nice. No, every other time's nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jeez. You know, I was even being sarcastic. I thought I'd get away with a fair question there. And you're like, dude, fuck you. Like, okay, yeah, I'm cooking end now. of the show. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome man that's awesome oh god well mate um yeah like i said in the beginning of the show um there there was one major reason um apart from the fact that you're a great bloke and we had a great conversation before um a major reason why i really wanted to pick your brain and that was about this vision quest um mm. that i haven't seen you write a whole lot I've, I've i've been waiting for the little you know snippets here and there but um spending a lot of time alone i think it was five days was it yeah, yeah. Five days. So that's um that's really, really exciting for me to to learn from you. So I suppose like if you could give the listeners um just a bit of context, what was going through your mind in, in the lead up? Like when did you start thinking that you wanted to do this this kind of solitary vision quest? Oh man, I've been you know thinking about this for years because I've been studying rites of passage for a long time and the men's work that I do and have have done for a while. And you know, I've taken myself through you know, various practices of solitude in different ways. And this particular rite of passage, this vision vision quest, um, it, it, I mean, it, it's something I've been thinking about for some time and it came to me just serendipitously and very, very seamlessly. And so I was at a Sacred Sons event, um, one of the pillar facilitators there. It's a Sacred Sons is a men's movement, just helping men really break free of their shadows and, and mm. step into healthier expressions of, of being a human being, essentially, you know, giving, providing support and providing tools and techniques to, for healthier practices in life and very similar to the work that we do as well in different ways. And so I was there facilitating and my brother, one of my good friends, Jetty, was there as well. And and I was speaking to – Jetty's more of a good friend now. At that time, was just more of an acquaintance and someone I deeply mutual respect and so forth. He was a friend, of course. I was speaking to a good friend of mine, um, Bam, and he had told me that he had done the vision quest with Jetty. And I said, poof, man, I'm all in on that. Like, tell me more and don't tell me more. You don't need <laughs> to. I'm all in. And I basically just went to Jetty that day. He was He'd finished facilitating. I'd finished facilitating. And I said, man, Bam just told me – Brendan just told me about – what he did with you, I'm all in, give me the details. And that was it. It was done. And then I went through the process and uh, because, you know, we all need support as men. You know, like it's, it's, you know, I consider myself, um, you know, a strong leader in the community in men's work. And I don't consider myself a a lone ranger either. You know, I need support. Um, I'm always growing. Uh, I don't always want to be leading 
a whole group of other people all the time. Sometimes I want to be led and to humble myself in that way and be open to the teaching and the wisdom of someone else, mm. someone else that I really respect and, and revere. And Jetty's one of those guys. And, and he really, um, he really put together a good team the men that were supporting that whole vision. There was 10 of us. And so we spent a few days together prepping for it. And then we just go in our separate ways and we just hit the wilderness and we just, we're by ourselves, no food, um, no books, no digital devices, minimal equipment. I just had a sleeping bag. Wow. Um, some water, I ran out of water because I did a couple of big hikes. And, and But the other than that, you're just sort of sitting in a circle and just being with nature. Um, that's it, you know, in, in the wilderness on your own. And I, I haven't, I've purposely not written a lot about it. Um, mm. I did a post, I did a couple of posts, mm. didn't, didn't do much. And you're the first person, I think, that's wanted to specifically interview me about this. I have, again, I haven't really spoken a great deal about it. Uh, I'm, you know, and I'm, I'm also um, selective with what I say as well, because yeah. it, it was a very personal experience. That's not to say I'm not going to share wisdom that I gained from it and what I think others can gain from doing it. Cause I want, um, I'd love for others to, to be supported by Jetty as well. He runs a very tight ship, um, good men that are there. You meet other good men as well. Um, and it's just, it, it's just something that I wanted to do as part of my journey. You know, mm. I've, ha- I've had experiences, Tom, in my life where, I've, I've been I'm about to I've been about to just embark on a particular experience. Like a couple of years ago, I went on a, a sexual somatic psychosomatic journey with a couple, an older couple that took me through this three four month journey. And before I started that, I knew that that was going to be a very integral piece in my growth. Like I mean, integral to the point mm. where I'm going to go deep. It's going to be very very difficult. I don't know if I'm going to get through it but I know it's going to unlock some stuff. And if I get through it, it's going to take me to the next level. And that, that was that type of experience. This wasn't that for me, but it was something that was needed. Um, It was for me, it wasn't physically or mentally challenging, but it was deeply revealing and Mm -hmm. deeply heart opening and humbling as well. And deeply, it allowed me to step into more profound levels of gratitude. Mm -hmm. And I knew that um, to be honest with you, to be completely transparent, the thing that I thought would scare me, because I fast a lot. Fasting's not, uh, it's not a difficult thing for me um, because I'm used to it. So it's not, I'm not, mm-hmm. not anything mm-hmm. special. I condition myself to it. It's like a marathon runner saying, yeah, I run 10 marathons a year and I've been doing it for 10 years. Like it's easy for me. That's not yes, it's conditioned, yes. conditioned to it. Well, what I was going to struggle with, I thought I was going to struggle with, which I didn't, which I was really surprised. I thought I was going to be, like I had a fear of the dark. Like I had a yes. fear of being in the wilderness at 9,000, eight and a half thousand feet elevation, so nearly 3,000 metres, 3 k's above sea level, in the wilderness, scorpions, we're in high alpine desert, scorpions, snakes, rattlesnakes, not so much bears, maybe coyotes, uh, maybe mountain lions because we're in California. Like, you know, all I had was a little knife. Like, it, that was what really worried me. But, man, let me tell you something. Being in nature on your own, and this was my experience, the sun went down, and it went dark and I just, it was just so comfortable. Mm. It was the most free. I, I just fell asleep like that. It was just wow. fucking epic. And that moment I realized so much more about myself than I thought in terms of my capacity and just, and just ability to be really present and connected to, to nature. So it was a really, that was a really beautiful experience. Mm. Man, you, you say um, you say you'd be afraid of the dark as though it's like a twelve-year-old in a comfortable bed, in you know, with the parents in the next yeah. room, and you're like, "Yeah, I was afraid of the dark," but then coyotes and snakes, and it's like, I think everyone would be afraid, mate. <laughs> you have a little <laughs> knife. <laughs> yeah, it's a good knife, but it was small. <laughs> good knife, good knife, exactly. No wonder you're trying to learn how to bow hunt. <laughs> yeah, go back out there, and yeah, that that's um. That's unbelievable. I think, you know, from the, from the more superficial perspective, just getting away from technology and getting away from, oh. you know, phones and all that sort of stuff, it's amazing how those things creep in. You know, I'll put the first one my hand up and, and just say, the phone has a hold of me, you know, in a big, big way. So did you find, and I know you've done this before with other things, and that's one of the reasons why I love following you because you're always offering these kind of challenges in, in 
you know, quotation marks to give us different perspectives on ourselves in the world. Did you find there was a, a transition between, I suppose, coming away from the technology or were you just like, right, I'm here on the quest? For me, I've done that numerous times in my in my life where I've gone a week or two weeks without the tech. Um, and, and, and again, it was just one of those things that when I remember when I first did, it was really difficult years ago when I first made a deliberate effort to have a digital detox <clears> and <throat> away from tech, it was difficult. I wanted to keep going back, but man, it's, you, you just, for me, I've learned to accept, and this isn't always true, but for the large part, in my, for the most part in my life, I've learned to accept the things I can't control. So we got up there and there's no reception. You can't get reception. There's no sat phone. There's no Wi-Fi. There's no reason for me to look at my phone. I took a couple of pictures of where I was um, sleeping. Mm-hmm. Uh, not, not when I was by myself, just when we were in the group. When, we, when I was by myself, I didn't bring my phone with me. I left it at base yeah. camp. I didn't, there's no point. I didn't, and parts of me wish I brought it with me so I could take pictures to show my loved ones where I was really beautiful and some of the hikes that I did. But at the end of the day, man, that's for me. It's not, it wasn't yes. for everyone else, you know? And so it was really easy. I just put my phone in my bag and I did not look at it for literally 11 days. There's no point. What, what am I going to look at? Like, it's not, yeah. I'm just going to look at a screen. And I just thought to myself, no, nah, I don't need that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a good I mean, point. the it's fucking blew point. up when you, you know, you're away for 11 days, it blows up after, you, you, you know, it's, it's, so I spent maybe two, three hours, not even like an hour and a half, two hours tending to emails, getting to everything. And once I did that, I felt good because I, I felt I didn't have all these things I had to get back to and attend to. And I put the phone away again. And yeah. that, that was it. Once we got down to, you know, low, lower altitude. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I think blowing up for me, I, you know, three text messages, uh, maybe an Instagram DM and I'd be, I'd be back out in the wilderness. <laughs> like, Oh God, what a day I've got ahead of me. <laughs> that was, that um, was hard, man. That was, that was, you know, you mentioned sort of, in, you know, what when I heard you say then sort of in and out of the, mm-hmm. it was hard leaving. It was really hard leaving. It was tough, man. And it's still, and it feels tough now a little bit as well, because, you know, I, I was away when everything here in the USC, in Australia at the moment, I know Melbourne's pretty locked down. I think Queensland's not too bad, but mm. um, Melbourne's really locked down at the moment. I know that Perth is, pretty free, but the borders are closed, right? Yeah. Whereas here in the US, the borders, internal borders aren't closed, but, oh, man, I went away and everything was on the up. Everything was on the up in a good way. Like, oh, should I say everything was on the down? Cases were down. People were freeing up again. Even California was loosening up a little bit, which is quite a stringent New York. But then in that 10 days I was away, everything escalated again. Numbers went up. Cases went up. And everyone went into contraction and fear. So I came back and there's all these new rules. You have to wear a mask again. You have to do this. So I, whoa. And so that was pretty intense. And I missed the simplicity of being in nature mm. and being on my own. Now, you know, if that was 30 days in or 50 days in or something or 20 days in, I don't know, maybe I'd have a different perspective. But that amount of time, I just sort of thought, I want to go back to nature. This is... yes connected it's it's crazy i I can can imagine you would have been in such a conflicted state because you're coming from this place where you're you know for all intents and purposes one with the oneness you know there's there's no fear there's pure pure consciousness and love um you know day four day five i'm assuming you're um pumped to come back and, and see your wife again there's that really strong urge to you know be with her in that state and then dropping into all the fear and, and, and not the least the, you know, can you call it like a culture war that it's kind of, I don't want to be um, extreme and call it a war, but there is that real thing going on in in the U S and, and I think to a lesser extent that the whole world as well, I think that would have been really interesting. How did you manage those, those different fluctuations? Um, with a little difficulty at the beginning, cause you know, I, 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 I realized that I've got very close friends in Australia, brothers that I've known for 20 plus years, you know, mm. um, I have very close male relationships and that was tough because I miss my friends. I miss my wife. Sure. That was, you know, I thought about, and I thought about how grateful I am for the people that I have in my life and I, I'm unable to see them and I don't know when I'm going to be able to be in their physical presence again. Mm. 
And that's a true thing. I mean, my brother messaged me yesterday and said, Steph, I, I can't come to the U S and not letting anyone out unless, um, you know, you've beat the last two years, you've been out of the country for 70% of the time and you can prove that like, there's this, this whole regimen that you have to go through. And so I don't know when I'm going to see my brother. Now, yes, I can go back to Australia. I have to quarantine myself for 14 days yeah. at my expense. That's not so much the issue, but being in a small room for 14 days, I mean, I can do that. That's fine. But do I want to? Exactly. Yeah. And then can I get back? Can I come back? I don't know. There's so much unknown at the moment. I don't know when I'm going to see my friends and, and family back in Australia. And so, mm. you know, I've got very close friends in Melbourne, Brisbane and Perth, particularly Perth, the density of it there. Mm. And so I'm not, I'm doing my best to not future project. I'm just being in the present and making work what I need to make work here and focusing on the amazing things that I do have here and the friendships and the connections that I have here. Cause we all need tribe, particularly men. I mean, we really need solid tribe in our lives. I just don't know. So that was really hard, man. Like to answer your question directly, I fucking cried for a couple of days, and yeah, and bloody I miss my brethren. You know, like I miss, I miss my brothers, and mm. um, you know, I gave myself permission to be pretty fucking sad about that, and also angry about that, and angry about the way that we're handling this as a society and as a collective leadership is. They're not failing us, but they're not exactly. You know, they're not they're not exactly putting in their best efforts. In no, my opinion, <laughs> my um, opinion too. <laughs> yeah, you know, and, and I, I believe it's you know people aren't too happy with um, leadership in Australia either. With uh, what's his name, Scott uh, Scott, Scott Morrison. Scott Morrison. I don't even know the fucking prime minister of Australia. It's so bad. <laughs> Scomo or something mate. they call him? Yeah, Scott, well, you're from Fiji, yeah. so it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> compared, oh, compared to me, mate, you look like you're from Fiji. I was just so <laughs> funny at the start of this podcast, man. I put this light on and yeah. um, I'm like, okay, I could put the tanning light on or I could be the really authentic one. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to go for the authentic one and I look like a ghost. <laughs> oh, God. Well, I'm getting in the sun, so I do get my sun here, that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> thank, thank, thanks for saying that, mate. That, that, that helps me with everyone that's going to watch the show. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that, you know, so to answer your question, it was difficult. Um, I gave myself a couple of days before I immersed myself into work again um, and, you know, work service clients mm. and so forth. And, um, but I, I wish I probably had a, even maybe four <laughs> or five days integration. I gave myself two days. That was okay. Um, but yeah, it was, uh, that was a tough transition because of the time. And so I still don't know when I'm coming back to Australia, um, and what that looks like. I mean, I live here obviously, but I, I visit at least once, twice a year if I can, but I can't now. So that's, that's, that's tough. And that was, that distance is, is difficult. You know, I speak to this often, make sure that you've got physical tribe as a man in your proximity and i do here mm. don't get me wrong and it's also different and that's taking i'm building that as well and i'm building the intimacy and the trust and the connection around that but again that's not a super hard thing for me to do but it's not about that it's also about i've had brethren that i've been we've had such diverse experiences with for 20 plus years 23 yeah years. it's massive uh, just don't replicate that and this distance that with this isolation that we're creating in our world at the moment it's a little concerning it, it's really concerning. Um, <clears throat> just, you know, to bring you home for a second. So yeah, so, so I'm in Melbourne right now and we've just moved into um, stage four lockdown um, over the past Ooh. two days or three days or something. Oh, yeah. That's even so deeper than what it was. It's even deeper, man. And it's, it's really it's deep. So we have a, um, we have an 8 PM to 5 AM home curfew. Only. Oh, what? Yeah. Only one Are you of fucking us. fucking serious? No, no, no. We can't leave the house oh, after 8 p.m. Uh, and we, well, for no, and no reason at all. No reason whatsoever. Yep. As far as I can understand, it's it's no reason. You have to be in your homes. It's it's getting a bit. Uh, I'm not. I don't get too. I, I'm interested in conspiracies, but not to the point where I start to lose myself down a rabbit hole. But you read 1984 back at school, and you're like, okay, there's a bit of similarity going on here. But that's just one of them, man. Like only. One hour a day, we're allowed outside for um, for exercise. Um, only one of us, so my partner and I live together. Only one of us can only one of us can leave the home to go shopping at any particular time. So I think it's something as bizarre as we can we can both 
drive to the supermarket, but only one of us can walk in there or something like that. It's very convoluted. Um, we all have to wear masks, masks compulsory, um, fines and things. And yeah, it's just, it, I'm so torn because. Is that written in the constitution? Is that written in, is that I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so. Pisses me off, man. See, they won't tolerate that shit here in Texas. Yeah. They'll pull a fucking gun on you. They just don't care. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> it's, it's, that, that's, re- oh man, that yeah. is so autocratic. That is so dictatorial. It's very restricting. And the thing that worries me the most is that I know suicide numbers are really, really on the high. And to your point before, you, you said like, when I came home, I allowed myself the time to be sad. You know, I allowed myself that time to cry. You have a very strong emotional intelligence. This is, this is your area. You know, this is where you kill it. And my biggest worry, uh, and particularly men as well, you know, my biggest worry is the typical guy who doesn't give a shit about mental health, is just not interested in it, you know, um, doesn't care about spirituality, loves Fords, you know, is really into his cars. And for whatever reason, um, he's just struggling with these emotions that he has no idea. He doesn't even know the word emotion and he's starting to have these crazy thoughts that he can't control. You, you and I know that if we feel jittery, I had a coffee before, after the podcast, I know I just need to walk the dog and exercise because it's good for me. Yeah. You know, I know these things, we know these things, but for people out there that just don't know with this whole fe- collective fear and these lockdowns and things, it really worries me. And you see the cases of suicide and domestic abuse, man, domestic abuse is going up massively as well. It's, it's just a, it's a scary time. Oh man. I'm sorry that you're going through that in Melbourne. I didn't realize that. I didn't realize that that's how that that's far to be honest with you, man. I think that's far stricter than anywhere here in the U S (laughs) <laughs> yeah yeah oh wow yeah it's 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 an interesting time and i think yeah it's i don't know people are doing what they can um i mean you know the aussie spirit like it's you know we're all in this together sort of stuff and i think that that kind of spirit pervades over into the u.s as well i'm sure but it's just very strange and you can look at it from that perspective of there's a whole lot of fear mongering and people are afraid and all these sorts of things but it's just annoying because we know what fear does, you know, fear separates and separation is the last thing we need right now. Mm. Crazy stuff, man. Mm. So, so crazy, man. (laughs) I know. I know. Oh, well, I'm sure we'll, uh, we'll get through it. We'll see what the vaccine does. And I think, you know, for whatever reason, it's just going to, I mean, I'm not, I can't see myself getting the vaccine, but, for whatever reason, I think it's just when that works and they find a strand and things might start going back to normal there and, and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, we'll see, hey? Yeah, I hope so, man. Look, I I'm, I know this isn't – well, it doesn't really matter what the podcast is about, so to speak. We're on the subject matter now. I was going to say it's not relevant, but I suppose it is. Look, I mean – it's not about whether the vaccine, if I'm for or against vaccines, personally, if a vaccine can help, if there's complete transparency on the ingredients, yep. if it's been trialed, tested, if there's accountability from the organization or the pharmaceutical company that's producing it. In other mm. words, that if there, there is inherent accountability on something going wrong, that they are liable for that, which they're not particularly in the US, and this is all, this isn't conspiracy, this is very matter-of-fact legislation Mm. that was passed years ago and so forth through certain administrations, and vaccines that can genuinely help people, um, then great. And, you know, there's no long-lasting negative side effects in terms of there's ingredients in there that are not, really absorbed by the human body in, in an in effective way. Mm, mm. Great. Let's, let's get vaccines. Sure. Sure. Personally, I'm not going to get a vaccine. <laughs> Same. <laughs> and it's not, it's not going to happen. I'm not, I'm not doing it. Um, but I can see how if there's a vaccine available and they make it um, and, you know, quote unquote works and it's effective in a healthy way. And, 
it's voluntary, mm-hmm. not mandatory, because that's a completely different conversation. Very. And it brings the world back online, not in a way like we were doing business before, because I think that way is done. It was done for a long time. And I've been saying it. I'm 38 now. I think I'm 38. Yeah, I'm 38. I've been saying it since I was 22, 23. The, the, the way that socioeconomically we function, yeah. we're done. It's been so it's great for that in terms of what this has exposed is that we can't function in this way anymore. Mm, mm. However, we're still trying to hold on. As a collective, we're still trying to hold on to the old. And I just don't know how useful that's going to be. I just don't. It's exposed, yeah. this virus has exposed a lot. And I'm just wondering, has it exposed enough for us to make some serious changes? I just don't think so. Mm. Do you mean holding on in terms of like the typical suit and tie, nine to five type career sort of thing? The American dream? Yeah. Yeah, that, that's part of it. Um, I mean, again, if we're talking about that nine to five, there's many studies that have been done in certain European countries, more liberal European countries that um, have been testing and experimenting with four day work weeks and six hour work days and so forth. And they're finding that the metrics around efficiency and productivity is far higher and happiness, um, general happiness within each individual and company culture is also higher as well. And so again, Mm -hmm. we're just attached to, old ways of doing things. It's the same with the education system. I mean, the education system is a derivative of the industrial era. It yeah. was used, you know, that structure and format was used to train um, industrial workers on assembly lines. I mean, let's, let's, let's fucking do something yeah. a little different here, guys. Just think a little laterally. I mean, fuck. It's, do we really need to get, get that archaic? I mean, let's, we're shifting, we're changing. Technology, globalisation, human consciousness, the expansion and access to different cultures and, and ancient mystical ways of being that don't need to be mystical anymore. They're just, I think we're just a little behind. And so that nine to five suit and tie, the corporate world, the parts of that, the, the entrenched culture of that I think is, is dying, but I don't think we're allowing it to die. I think that's the issue when there's resistance, right? Change wants to happen. Some want change. Some want to remain in the familiar. There's massive tension and resistance. And in that tension and resistance, if we stay there, we get more tension and resistance. So something needs to give. We need to go back to where we were or move forward. But, you know, there's always going to be tension and resistance. It's just can we minimise it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is this is a really interesting topic of discussion at the moment. I think I think people are you know desperate for some kind of alternative here, and you know to your point, you know all the mystical texts and all this sort of stuff that aren't even mystical. You know, in comparison to what we're doing now, they're just they're just practical. You know, like not not the least this idea. I think people are very um, resistant to this idea of like a, a spiritual politics because the way look, you know, as an as an outsider looking in, the whole the whole US political frame seems like it's a popularity contest of who can drop the mic the best in like two minutes. And it's just like, when are we going to start to realize that like, hang on a second, you're about to be the most powerful person in the world speaking with another potentially very powerful person. Let's try to figure out together and drop the ego bullshit to figure out together, like how we can save the world and, and, and be friends with everyone. You know, I'm not, I'm not trying to say that sarcastically or, or tongue in cheek. Like it's very, very serious. These, and it, it, like, I remember having those kinds of conversations when I was 15, I remember Michael Campbell who had the locker next to me said, I have more MySpace friends than you. And it, and I was gutted, man. <laughs> and I hear that oh, kind man. of thing going on over there. <laughs> yeah. You know? I hear you, man. I, I just, you know, when I see, and and I, you know, I'm human, just like the next person. When 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 I'm faced with atrocity or difficulty or challenge, you know, there's parts of me that at times crumble, and there's parts of me that at times experience a great deal of difficulty. And I do my best to see that silver lining within every experience. And this is one of them in, in the sense that we have a real opportunity to do things differently at quite a drastic scale, like a larger mm. scale, not just something really small and minute. I think that's what we're 
we're missing. That's that's the that's the notion that we're missing. We're too busy surviving, and we don't have to be, but we make ourselves it's like we're we're glutton for glutton for punishment. You know, we can do things differently. And I don't know completely what differently looks like, man. I really don't. Like I've got some ideas, but I think we have to be open to, okay, well, let's do, let's not just fight for the old. Let's actually look at what does it mean to do something different and get different minds, great minds coming together and thinking about this and being open to it. I think that's where from that, that creative think tank, we will come into a, a greater place. And you know, that healthy warrior will come out in us, particularly as men, as opposed to that, wounded warrior yes which is all about fighting for the old and the entrenched and keeping one way of living alive now sometimes that's useful because we have to retain our sense of our lifestyle because it's actually important and it's it's healthy like look at something like um avatar the movie avatar but again that's all value based right like you just mm-hmm. had competing values you had a society that was deeply connected to nature and there was a oneness and a unity there and there was a communication and you had another society that was all about you know raping and pillaging and uh, industry at any cost and energy consumption and expansion at any cost and there wasn't there wasn't a, a deeper understanding of how do we work in symbiosis mm. now it's it's not that that value set is better than the other value set it's just different what do we value as a society? But we also have to, we're finite beings, so we have to look at the caring and the carrying capacity of the earth, ecologically, socioculturally, socioeconomically, geopolitically. We have to look at how we, how, what systems are we implementing in the world? Mm. And when we talk about men, we all have a role to play. And, and for me, I think that men, it, it's time that we're transitioning out of that wounded warrior into that healthy warrior archetype that is fighting for sustainability and longevity, that is fighting for a deeper level of connection, that is fighting for clarity because the healthy warrior knows himself, knows his values, isn't driven by constriction and retraction and fear. And I I think that's Mm -hmm. the opportunity that we have. And that warrior, by the way, resides within men and women. It's not just men. Just specifically speaking to men because Mm -hmm. men for so long have led on the front lines in this way. And some of us have done an amazing job. Some of us not so amazing. Mm. And then we have to take ownership and responsibility of that as well. And look at this as a potential turning point in our world. Yeah, totally, man. I think I'd love for you to speak a bit more on that. What, how, when you're dealing with, um, with men dealing with, (laughs) that's a weighted term. When you're dealing with these fuckers who are paying you money, mate, God, (laughs) <laughs> what's up what's up with your life <laughs> um, you know what does a transition from that wounded masculine to that to that um that warrior essence kind of look like like what are some of the, the typical resistance changes for, for for guys kind of listening and for women as well like you said well for me the wounded warrior is really stuck in the past is abrasive argumentative is more focused on the fight for the sake of the fight as opposed to why mm. he or she is fighting, he or she is protecting. It's, you know, it's less about servant-based leadership and less about stewardship and more about the addiction to adrenaline and the addiction to tension and friction and fight, you know. Mm. Nice. It's, it's that wound of... I need to fight at any cost to protect myself, to figure out who, you know, to defend what is me or what I think is right, as opposed to listening. And, you know, for me, an intelligent warrior and a humble warrior and a warrior that is healthy only uses his or her weapons or only goes to the fight as a last resort because they have that confidence. They, they know they can fight. They know they can protect. They know they can go to that level of intensity. They choose not to. It's it's a last resort thing. Whereas that wounded warrior just fights for the sake of fighting for ego because ultimately they're so insecure that it's a false bravado that comes out. Mm. It's not a calmness. It's just I'm going to protect myself because I'm so insecure. So I'm going to display feats of strength and oppression, subjugation, judgment, harsh critique, autocracy, 
because that's going to, that's a mask that hides my fragile ego. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I remember we were, we were speaking about, um, you know, that, that, that physicality aspect coming out as a last resort. Um, I think you and I both started jujitsu around a similar time. Obviously we haven't been able to do that anymore. Wait, is jujitsu open over there? No. Uh, bro, I don't even know. And I, I was, I, I really need to check it out. I was actually just talking to Christine about this the other day. I'm really hanging to go back. I don't actually think it is. No. I don't yeah. think it, and, that, and that's why I haven't even bothered looking. But in saying that, you reminded me, so I'm going to send an email. It was a, it was a, um, a school just up the road. So, bar oh, place. so I'm going to have a look. That's where I was meant to go, but it all shut down when coming in March. Yeah, yeah. Can you imagine doing that with a mask on? That'd be bizarre. <laughs> it's like <sighs> genuine poker face going on there. <laughs> <laughs> I know. But to your point, man, like, you know, and I think we, we were discussing this before, so we don't need to go into it too much, but you watch like a black belt, you know, and they are almost bored. And me as a white belt, I'm like, I'm going to do all these things. I'm going to pull my knife out. I'm going to be, I'm going to get you. And they're like, they're waiting for you just to do the shittiest move. And they're like, okay, black belt, done. <laughs> it's a shocking feeling, but I mean, you know, it's very, very humbling. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I hear that. That's awesome. That's awesome. And I think there was another thing I wanted to speak to you about, mate. Last time we finished, you mentioned that you were putting a whole thing together around this. I think it was like an online service with yourself and Christine around being the king and, and being the queen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there was – when did we speak last, by the way? Oh, man, I was – yeah, I think the it was – Last year? I think, yeah, it was definitely last year. It was, it was yeah. maybe like September-ish, october Yeah, so what I was putting together was, and we've run um, two two of these already. They've been super oh, sick. Um, Be the Queen. And, Be the Queen. Um, what it, well, I think that's what we were talking about. So yep. Yep. there's a couple of things, and I'll go through both of them. So Be the Queen mm-hmm. was one of them, which is just for, for single ladies essentially, and for ladies in relationship, but it's more for single women that are looking to really do some deeper work on themselves and attract a very healthy relationship and relationships in their lives. You know, heal the past wounds mm. that they've developed or that, that they've been exposed to over the years, heal the, the parental relationships, just get really clear on who they are, who they want to be, get that support around them and then begin to attract healthy men in their lives, healthy rela- intimate romantic partnerships. So there's Be The Queen, but just at the tail end now, that second one, which has been super successful and super amazing. Um, and then we were doing some deeper work with both men and women who were meant to have a, um, we call it, our brand is Love Amplified. Mm. So we're meant to have Love Amplified brand. Um, there was a five-day event in September here in Austin where we had to cancel it because mm. of COVID. So, and that was really bringing people together and that wasn't just couples, that was individuals as well, but showing people and helping people understand polarity dynamics, masculine and feminine energetics, helping people relate to each other beyond just communication, um, but also how to see when someone is coming from wounding and when they're not. And it was going to be, it was going to be really powerful breath work and somatic work and a lot mm. of that deeper inner child healing as well. Um, but we had to cancel that. So Instead, what we've done is we, we ran an, an inner child workshop, virtual workshop. It was, too, again, super successful. We had 300 people there in April. It was amazing. We've got another level one at the end of this month and a level two now in um, October, September replacing that sort of that Love Amplified. So it's Love Amplified in a Child, which is a level two three-day experience as well, which, again, is just going deeper into those childhood wounds to help people. So it's less about sexual sexuality less about sexual dynamics and sexual polarity but more about laying some foundations and clearing out the clutter so there's a Mm. component of what we did what we were going to do but again you know when things come back online next year we'll have an amazing retreat as well here in the u.s Mm. yeah or yeah it was right it was the it was the be the queen i think that um yeah really got me interested um when you were talking about it because i think i'd love for you to speak on this i think from, from what I can see by following people like yourself and, and John Weil and stuff, there's this, this, this real, really good understanding, I suppose, that like the, the social feminine, if you can call it that, that has been oppressed for so long by that wounded masculine archetype that we're talking about before. 
has this, and correct me if I'm wrong, this difficulty relaxing into love and, and relaxing because, you know, there's, there's just so much clutter and baggage from the past. Um, yeah, what are some of the roadblocks that, that come up in that work with, with the individuals that you work with? It's a really great question, Tom. So my, a friend of mine, um, she asked me a question last night. She said, what do you feel um, some of the biggest issues are with men and women separately, generally speaking? So just generalisation. Mm-hmm. And I, I left her voice there and I said, you know, some of the biggest issues that I feel women face is not having a sense of safety. There was a mass study done, um, and I can't remember which university, but essentially the, the, the question asked that if there, were no, if there were no men in the world as a woman, what would, the, what would be the first thing you would do? And the overwhelming majority of women answered, I would just go for a walk by myself at night. So there's this deep visceral, yeah, and this isn't, this isn't blaming men saying men are bad, yeah. not at all. It's, it's just that... The way we've been relating to each other, it hasn't been the healthiest. And we have to, yeah. there's some responsibility we need to take. And so women generally, and again, there's so many women that I work with, they feel unsafe and they've either been physically, emotionally, sexually abused. And by the way, so many men have two men. So mm. anecdotally speaking, when I'm, um, and this is an empirical, so this is anecdotal. When I'm, and, and what that is, is that just subjective personal observation, what I mean by anecdotal because for anyone that's curious about what that means, it's not common terms, right? So mm-hmm. when I run groups where there's 10 people or 100 people and I'll go through, we start, you know, clearing out clutter of the past, abuse and so forth, man, minimum six, seven men out of 10 have been sexually abused. Minimum. Wow. wow. Minimum. Shit. Women, it's even higher. So this is a very, very common thing, right? And a very common theme. And so women feel very unsafe. Men feel very unworthy very not appreciated, very not respected, very, very confused and lost. So these are the common themes that men and women have. And of course, there's a foundation of not feeling safe. When you peel that back for a man, it's not feeling safe. And it's more, <laughs> the funny thing is, it's feeling less emotionally safe for men. So it's, it's I don't feel emotionally safe enough. And for women, wow. I don't feel physically safe enough in my body. <laughs> And, and in, in, in society, which is a sort of you think is a paradox, right? But yeah. it's not because because men aren't taught how to emote. Societal values, familial values, don't really give men the opportunity to emote clearly. And additionally to that, it's either not acceptable or we don't know how. And so the, when we don't know how to do something, guess what? Men don't when they're uncertain about something, they don't feel very safe and confident. Or they don't feel very confident. When you don't feel confident, you don't feel safe because you don't believe in what you're able to do. So there's so much uncertainty and unknown. So ultimately we're facing very similar issues just in slightly mm. different ways, expressed differently. Mm. That's so interesting, man. <laughs> it's, it's so um, unfortunate. And, you know, when I first started looking at myself, it was, it was very much like I didn't know how to express emotions mm. and all that sort of stuff. But it's so funny when you think about that, like, a human animal, an animal doesn't know how to express itself. It's like, it's like you're the sun going, I don't know how to be hot. <laughs> it's this is such a, such a fucking great example that you just, and that's exactly, it's like men don't have a limbic system. It's like we don't yeah. have emotive faculties. And so of course we do, yeah. but we're not taught how to access them and leverage them in, in an empowered way for, for various reasons, yeah. some that I've already mm-hmm. outlined. And that's, I think that's a, it's a big issue, right? It's a big pain point. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and and when you when you're working with these men, do you feel like when you finally give them access to that, not necessarily just time, because they'd be like, oh yeah, I've tried to sit and cry or be angry or whatever, and it's just never come out. When it finally comes out, I'm sure it would just come out by the absolute thousands, you know. <sighs> yeah, yeah, I think about that. I, you know, when when a man has access to when a man is given permission and feels confident enough to access his emotions, he can really go there. It can take some warming up though. Fuck, it takes some warming up like it really yeah. does. But if we can get, and again, it's not about being leaky, and I hope I'm, I'm answering this correctly. It's not about being mm-hmm. leaky in one's emotions. It's not about, you know, being over-vulnerable and not having context and structure around that. 
that's because that's not that's not what men want to do and it's not what women want and it's not what men want either. However, when we can emote in safe spaces and express, not just emote, but express and share, that's the most important. Share the fucking load, share the burden. Mm. We mm. feel so isolated as men. This is a, that's another common theme, complete isolation in, in men. Mm. So many, the modern man is so isolated. He's, not, he's alone. He doesn't have close friends. I'm a rarity, man. I know I'm a rogue in, 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 when I say I've got different, a few different, for quite a few different friends that I'm deeply rich connections with. Mm. That, that's, a, that's not common, man, at mm. all. I've worked many years on that. That's a very uncommon thing. And so men are so isolated, but once you give them permission and the, the safe space environment to share and, and unload with other men particularly, witnessed by brethren, the familiar, sense of familiarity, you know, we start to shift that narrative around men can't express or men can't emote or men uh, are shut off. We start to shift that narrative. We start to connect as a humanity at a deeper level. We start to celebrate our differences as opposed to judge our differences. Yeah, yeah. And and you, you said something there which I um, would love for you to talk on more. You said, um, you know, without becoming kind of flimsy or gooey and because there's a real resistance and I think it's a fair resistance as well. Like it, I have that resistance um, for, for this, this push for men to express themselves. I think it, that's like one half of it. But, but to your point, it's like it's good to express our emotions, but where's the structure and the container around that and the, yep. and the openness? Um, could you could you talk a little bit more about what that all means? Yeah. So essentially, if you know, I have met again. I'll just speak from personal personal experience. I have many women that come to me and and say, you know, I want my man to be more emotional. I want him to be able to express his emotion and so forth. And then it can be something that's very new. And, and, and men are told there's this narrative in society that you have to be more emotional, you have to do this, you have to express. And so some men go lean into that and then there are many women that push, push them away. Yeah. And they then feel rejected because it's too overwhelming for uh, uh, people, not just a woman, but even men. It's just too overwhelming to experience a man emote at that level with no, mm. no understanding of where his emotions are coming because he's turned on the tap. It's, it's years of oppression and suppressed emotions and suppressed thoughts and, and not sharing with anyone. And it can be too overwhelming for whoever's holding that unless they've done deep inner work themselves. And even then, no one person should have to hold that. So then they're pushed away, then they're rejected, and then that notion is reinforced, although I shouldn't express because it just gets me more pain, so I'm going to shut down again. And so that's why, it's important. Yeah. that's why it's important that men are sharing with other men in groups of men where we're holding each other and seeing each other physically or metaphorically holding each other and supporting each other and giving each other context, giving each other permission so that, that, that we don't bring that overwhelming emotion to our partners, but we bring truth, vulnerability and transparency to our partners mm. and emotion, but not in a leaky or unstructured way where we have no idea what it means because that woman's going to want to know, what does this mean to you? I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? Because there's an expectation that men know things, right? We want to know things, even self expectations. Yes. So, you know, there is something to be said for cognitive interaction and intelligence and understanding and knowing, but we have to go through a process of feeling and, 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 and shifting somatically those big emotions through our nervous system and those trauma before we can understand it and compartmentalize mm. it and be, be in clear, you know, intelligent coherence with it. And when we do that in a self-reliant way, in solitude and with other men or other support systems, psychologists, counselors, et cetera, support groups, we bring a more refined, clearer version of that to our loved ones, to our children, to our brothers, our sisters, our, our wives, whatever. That's more powerful and that's more empowering for all people involved. Mm. It doesn't mean mm. you're not being honest. You are. It's just coming from a more coherent way, a more connected, mindful way. Yes. So, so from, so, and obviously we're speaking um, from the heterosexual perspective now, but the masculine yeah. and feminine, um, when the feminine is saying something akin to, you know, I want my, my guy or whatever to, to be me, me more emotional. It's not so much, am I right in saying it's not so much um, they want them just to turn the tap on and go for it, but just even a little bit of presence to the relationship. Like, Hey, I'm, I'm really tired. I had a big day at work. I'm going to tune out and watch the footy. Um, but when I've watched the highlights, um, I'll make some team and we can talk about the day just even a little bit, you know, I think I think that's healthy. 
I think understanding why men tune out as well is important. So from a physiological perspective, there's a depletion in testosterone at the end of the day. And mm. so engaging in, I don't want to say mindless, but very simple activities help us relax in a more, in a beta state. So they relax our beta brainwave state. So we're still awake, we're still present and we're restoring testosterone mm. and we're restoring our physiology. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why we tune out. And also wow. we've been, most men have been very, complex all day and women have as well people in our society are just very complex during the day with problem solving and business and like an influx of you know information overload and and, um over like desensitization and sensory overload and so we want to unpack so you have to make agreements with your partners in relationships say look i generally when i get home i have big days i need to unwind and i and i also at the same time want to connect with you but i want to be really replenished so give me 20 minutes or 30 minutes or an hour. I'm just going to go, you know, go for a cycle or go for a walk or watch TV for 20 minutes. Or I'm going to read a book. Or I'm just going to have a shower or I'm going to relax and I'm going to go for, and then I'm going to come back. And I'm going to be present to you. Like you got to have those agreements, you know, and, and work what that, what, what is that for both of you? What does that look like for both of you? And that's for women as well. Women are going to want that space. It's not just a man thing. It's a, it's an attachment theory thing. It's a psycho emotion. It's an upbringing thing, a conditioning thing, a product of our environment thing. There's many factors that influence that. And it's not just male and female. Um, there's masculine and feminine energetics to it, but it's more having agreements in your container as in a relationship. Mm, shit, dude, I, I didn't know. Um, I didn't know anything about that. Um, testosterone depletion. Is that you've been getting into that area a little bit lately? Yeah, I've been. I mean, I've been. You know, I'm not an expert by any means, but I've been into neuroscience for quite some time, and the neuroscience of relationships, understanding what's happening in the brain, and mm. um, hormones and bodies and so forth. But uh, yeah, I mean, I'm very fascinated by that. Not for not for a way to explain everything. It's just part of who we are. Our biology is part of who we are. It's not the be all and end all, but it's important. And so I want to understand totally. psychology, emotion, biology. I want to understand the inter- integration, the psycho and, and immunobiology of how we work and all of that. It's the spirituality. And uh, yeah, it's important to. Mm, yeah, that's, that's, that's awesome, man. So even, even something as simple as just when you're in that depleted state, like I know this can probably sound obvious, but just resting. To, to actually regain it. Do you know like the buffer on that? Like, does it take a while? Obviously I'm very interested. I want to get my squad up. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's a good point. I mean, you, you know, you're talking about a- activity and passivity, right? You're talking about active passive, you, you know, when we're talking about replenishing and being able to uh, goal, accomplish goals. Rest is a big part of that. The quality of sleep that we have is a big part of that. You know, neuroscience is demonstrating this, our ability to um, rest during the day, it, it assists with that as well. What the exact buffer is, I'm not sure, man. I'm still doing so much research and there's so much research out there. And mm. some of it is also what works for you as an individual too. There is some subjectivity to it. Yes. Yeah, no, for sure, for sure. I think I think it's such an important, yeah, having all these things, you hear people talk about things just from the spiritual perspective and there's a real almost a dogma with that. You know, we are all one. It's like, okay, cool, I get it, but I've got a penis, you know. <laughs> there's all these other things yep. as well, um, you know, that I think are really important as well. So, yeah, that's awesome, man. Um, mate, um, I, I won't keep you for too much longer. I love doing I think um, – what was fun about this podcast for me was I had a very basic idea of kind of what I wanted to hit on, um, specifically that vision question, how the transition was. And then very quickly, it's just like, now I feel like I've caught up with Steph, you know, now I feel like we're, <laughs> we know each other again. So it's good. <laughs> yeah. that's, uh, that's awesome, man. What's, what's coming up for you, mate? Um, what's coming up in the next couple of months? Well, yeah, I've um, got the, the inner child workshop from so from a service work perspective, got the inner child workshops level one and level two, which are super deep and, and powerful and fun. Um, we have a, a virtual vision quest coming up actually. Oh, helping sick. people just yeah, just get their lives back online because there's been so much turmoil. Um, so it's a six week virtual vision quest where we're gonna really help people go through the process of releasing the past, getting in the present, identifying the future and integrating that into their, into their lives moving mm. forward. So that's, we're excited about mm. that. Uh, I'm excited to have a, um, a, a winter, a, a Christmas winter again. Um, you know, I'm just excited about that and try and get in the snow um, for Christmas this year. That's, I'm excited mm. about that. Excited about starting some new projects and service around um, child sex trafficking. It's just something that I'm passionate, my wife and I are passionate about. Um, and have been for some time and also the environment. I'm very passionate about um, ecology. So getting involved in some side projects there as well, just 
unpacking that and um, investing time, energy and, and money in that as well and, and being a part of some really big things. And, and so that's unraveling. So we're really excited about that give back component as well. I'm excited mm. about that. Excited about, um, I'm, you know, I'm on a new program for, for pressing and, and pull-ups and just my health and wellness and getting my gym <laughs> sorted, just finalizing that, my home gym, my garage gym. So, yeah, just little things that I'm very grateful for that I have access to, bro, that I'm just grateful for, man. I'm just really grateful that I have food in my fridge and mm. you know, I live in a beautiful home and a roof over my head and amazing people in my life and get to have these conversations and just very humbling, man. So I want to give as much as I can. I'm excited for more creation as well. And um, I'm working on some pretty cool things at the moment in terms of how I can serve at a deeper level. So just those things. Mm, that's brilliant, man. Have you, Podcasts, books on the agenda. I've got. A, I've written a book in 2012. Um, but I, I'm yeah, absolutely. Book book is. I'm in the process of, of writing a couple of books right now. So oh, nice. I just chip away at that. I chip away at that, and I enjoy that. Um, and I probably need to prioritise that at some point soon. I think I will in the new year. I'm, I'm hmm. looking at what direction I want to take with that. Podcast as well. Yes, it's just a matter of um, launching it in an appropriate way. And again, getting there. Getting there. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. exactly. You, you do. I, I, I love that response because I think people are like, yeah, I'm doing this. I'm doing this. I'm like, but is it fun? Like, are you enjoying it? <laughs> no. <Yeah. laughs> oh, great. <laughs> yeah. I want to be in the space and I do. I love, and again, I do a lot of videos. So, you know, that's my podcast fix, so to speak, but I do need to get on iTunes and get my podcast up. But again, that's in good time. Totally. Totally, man. Totally. No, mate, um, I, I love talking to you. I've, I've had the pleasure, obviously, to chat to you now um, for probably about two hours in total now. And I think you're you're really one of the few out there that, you know, you, you really do put your money where your mouth is. You're kind of like, hey, vision quests are important. I did a five-day one. <laughs> Just by the way, I didn't even five days. Like, oh, okay, this this, this dude's legit, you know. So I, I really appreciate you, mate, for, for showing up and doing the work. And, and also to you can tell that you really love it. And I, I think that's so yeah. important in this space. There are so many people out there that preach all these things, but you see it's like a, it's a job for them, you know, and yeah. this isn't a job for you. It's deeper than that. It's more rewarding than that. And, um, yeah. you know, the, the, the open and honest conversations you seem to have with, with your wife, your, the, the way you live your life, I think is a real testament to how good you are at this work. So I really appreciate you for coming on the show, mate. It, it won't be the last and um, I'm looking forward to it again. Thank you, brother. I appreciate you very much. Awesome, man. Thanks, guys. Thanks so much. Talk soon. Hey, guys. If you enjoyed the content, uh, you are more than welcome to click the link in the description below. That will take you right to a free webinar where I will be taking you exactly through how to design a framework for your life and create that mission that will bring about a sense of intrinsic value to you. Go for it.